Okay, we are live on Facebook. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, with us here, we have Representative Rick Larson and Representative Susan Del Bene. Uh, they're gonna kick us off with a conversation as well as some updates. Um, and afterwards we will um, do a Q&A. So please feel free to leave a question in the comments below of this video and we'll get to as many as we can. So with that, uh, Representative Larson, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks Jack. And uh, again, I'll just, I'll just emphasize to everybody to uh, get your questions in to Jack and uh, we'll get to those uh, a little later. But um, now uh, I do want to recognize a special guest from all the way over in the first congressional district, <laughs> Susan Del Bene. Thanks a lot for coming on, Susan. Um, this is the second, yeah, the second Facebook Live uh, uh, that we've done with a uh, guest. So Tina Podolowski was my guest. Uh, uh, I'm kind of running this as an interview show, but it really isn't that, folks. We want we want you to um, um, we want we do want you to uh, want to hear your questions. But we also Susan and I both want to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in Congress from our individual perspectives. So you know that as well as uh, what's going on in our campaigns um, and where you can um, access our campaigns, help out our campaigns, and. and and so on, but uh, we'll also, of course, uh, answer your questions. I and I have a few questions for Susan, and I think she probably has a few for me. And um, uh, then we'll get we'll get to all of yours. I think what I want to start off with, uh, though, is, is to recognize um, the real uh, pain the the country is going through, our own state is going through, in our region um, after the murder of George Floyd and with the murders of uh, Breonna Taylor and, and Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, and those, those killings were just a tip of a, a very large iceberg when it comes to violence against um, uh, African-Americans in, in this country and really systemic uh, or uh, emblematic of systemic racism in this country. And so we, we do need to address that. And I think um, what we're trying to do in Congress is passed something we call the Justice in Policing Act. And I will note that it is really just focused on um, policing. Uh, there are more and, and broader issues that we have to deal with in terms of economic opportunity, um, housing, um, education, uh, and other ways to really address the, the problems of racism in this country. But this Justice in Policing Act is an important bill. It incorporates ideas that um, I was able to glean from uh, local uh, elected leaders and local community leaders uh, from Everett to Bellingham. Uh, it incorporates ideas from President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, a report that was done in 2015, and some ideas as well from uh, a 2018 report from the US Commission on Civil Rights um, that was uh, done for uh, the US House and the US Senate. Um, not surprisingly, um, the, that report was shelved because the, the, the current president uh, really wasn't all that interested um, in the report. And we did see today where the president came out with an executive order on, on police reform, but it, it, it doesn't go anywhere um, as far as what we're trying to do in the U.S. House with the Justice and Policing Act. Um, there's a variety of elements to that. Uh, just no banning chokeholds, banning no knock warrants ending the transfer of military grade equipment to state and local law enforcement, requiring federal police officers to use body cameras and dashboard cameras, creating a nationwide police misconduct uh, registry and a variety of other things as well. And you should expect the US House of Representatives to vote on that, I think the end of next week, um, around the 25th and 26th, if I'm not mistaken, um, we'll be back in session and uh, on the floor of the House. So. Uh, bear with us as we, over the next couple of weeks, uh, work through this and get it on the floor. And if you have some ideas you want us to um, consider, tonight's a great night to, to offer those. Um, I will note just on my, um, I want to just touch on that as an issue and then I'll just flip over to the campaign and then uh, recognize, uh, recognize Susan for some comments. On the campaign side, uh, we are going really 
really hard. Uh, we're doing phone banking. I'm phone banking tonight after this, after this Facebook live event. Um, we can't doorbell. Um, or I suppose I suppose we could doorbell. I think I probably would get through one door before I was told not to doorbell by by someone. So um, so instead, we're doing a lot of phone banking and uh, uh, making a lot of contacts with with Democratic voters. Uh, now, as we gear up towards the ballots being dropped in about four weeks, so the ballots are coming out uh, fairly soon. I've done about uh, 20 separate Zoom type events uh, on the um, with local party groups as well for outreach. I've done seven or eight or nine Facebook Live, um, shorter Facebook Live events as well. And then, of course, this is the second sort of long form. Uh, Facebook Live event. So we're trying to do a lot of different things to take advantage of the technology and get um, do some outreach to, to voters and and to get input from people as well. It's been uh, it's been a challenge. It's been a, it's been a change. It's telling people um, uh, not not to get too philosophical for folks, but Plato uh, once said that um, he wrote uh, uh, that um, humans are political animals, and he didn't mean that we're um, that we are political in terms of joining political parties and things. It means that humans uh, need to be with each other, need to be around each other. Um, and uh, uh, you know, not ironically, po politicians, people, elected officials need to be uh, around people. And so it's been a real different change um, having to run a campaign when you can't actually be in a room with 50 people to talk about uh, what's going on or to hear their views or going to doorbell and seeing people on their doorstep and talking to them personally. Um, it, so it's required some changes on our part, but I think we're doing all right in that regard. And uh, I hope you can help us out on the My Campaign. Um, I'll make the pitch for that. You can go to my website at ricklarson.org if you want to volunteer. Um, you can also sign up to get a yard sign um, and sign up for our phone banks. And so uh, again, I just want to touch on one issue of, of, uh, of this Justice and Policing Act and uh, talk a little bit about campaign. And now I wanna recognize um, uh, Susan Del Bene. So Susan, Susan represents the first congressional district and um, uh, it doesn't make it the best. It's just- I usually say it does make it the best. <laughs> it's just numerically. <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas I'm the second. And I did ask her because we share- um, Which is a, share close, a close second. A close second. <laughs> yeah, they, I actually don't represent the second district. I, I represent the close second district. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we share the uh, Whatcom, Skagit, and Snohomish counties. Um, so we try to coordinate uh, a lot of things that we do as well. And um, so I wanted to uh, ask her to come on, share a little bit about the things she's working on and how she sees campaigns rolling out as well. And uh, I've got a few questions for her. But Susan, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rick. It's great to be here. And um, I should say happy belated birthday because I believe yesterday was your birthday, right? Yesterday was my birthday. I'm so, 55. Yeah. I didn't get thanks. to say it to, um, and uh, look at you uh, directly. So now I, I can do that. So I, I got your text. Great day yesterday. I, I, I did get a text. <laughs> I did text. The, the power of, of Bitmoji texts. Um, That's but, right. Uh, yeah. So I. Uh, um, as Rick said, we do represent, I represent the first congressional district, which goes from northeastern King County up to the Canadian border. And um, the our districts are right next to each other and across um, Snohomish, um, Skagit, and Whatcom counties. We really share those districts, those regions. That's, um, you know, just because there's a line um, between what district is the first or the second, um, we really share communities that are all working together. So, um, um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to join you today, uh, even though we're virtual. Um, and uh, this is uh, a uh, just a really challenging time in our country. And the and and Rick brought up a lot of the work that is happening in Congress with respect to addressing police brutality, systemic racism. Um, and um, I'm a original co-sponsor of the Justice and Policing Act, the legislation that um, Rick spoke about. And so I won't reiterate all the pieces of that legislation, uh, all the components of that legislation that he did, but um, just wanna highlight that this, to really change something that has 
been a part of our country since our founding and um, is still a huge challenge. It could take all of us. It's going to take all of us and every level of government to um, call out injustice when we see it. Um, I was born in Selma, Alabama. Um, and when I was a very, very young um, child, John Lewis walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge standing up for civil rights, um, standing up for voting rights. And um, we both have the incredible honor of serving with John Lewis, which was one of the most amazing things for me when I was elected. Um, and I serve with him on the Ways and Means Committee now. Um, he said that if you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, we have a moral obligation to do something about it. And so we all have that obligation to do something about it. And one thing we can do is address it through policy. Um, that's definitely and incredibly important. And the legislation that we're proposing in the House, the Justice and Policing Act, is an incredibly important step. Um, but it's going to mean steps at, in local government, steps at, um, at the state level. But every single one of us participating, um, calling things out, standing up, and speaking up. And so I just want to thank all of you for doing your part to make a difference throughout our country. Um, this is also uh, an incredibly challenging time from a health standpoint in terms of just the concerns that everyone has about the pandemic. The impact it's had on our communities. Um, we were hit hard um, right here in our region with our first cases, um, just the, the spread, um, what happened in Kirkland and the impact on nursing home. Um, and we continue to see those impacts across the country. So having a strong, coordinated federal response has been important. I've been disappointed um, there in terms of the administration's response. And I know as members of Congress and the House, we've worked very hard to pass legislation to really address the economic needs that folks have, as well as the healthcare needs, um, and making sure that we have resources for things like, like um, protect, personal protective equipment and testing. Um, we are far behind where we should be there, and I think we are continuing to not only make sure there, there are resources available, but um, but we're pushing more legislation in the House because we need to make sure that we have resources to help our communities, um, to help uh, make sure that the materials that we need to kind of help bend that curve are available in terms of testing and protective equipment and contact tracing. Um, and that is a, another important effort ongoing in the House and we'll be continuing to work on to make sure that um, there are resources to help families get by. Um, the, the, um, Rick talked a little bit about this being a, you know, a strange election time, and it is. Um, I think we've all done many types of video conference um, um, get-togethers um, in various, Zoom and many other technologies as ways to get um, people together. And in some ways, they have been incredible conversations because we have a chance to um, can it bring people together that may not live in the same area, may not normally have come to the same event together and have had some really great conversations. And so I think there have been um, some, some kind of positive outcomes in that way of connecting um, folks together, but especially in um, areas in the, in my district in the Eastern part of the counties, we still have huge challenges with um, connectivity and it really has highlighted the gaps that we have in terms of people's ability to use technology um, and have those same opportunities, whether it's kids taking online classes, whether it's uh, businesses trying to continue to move forward um, in an online fashion, or whether it's campaigns and folks trying to connect with communities. So um, I think that we're still going to do whatever we can to get out and try to connect with folks where connectivity may not be easy. Um, and that is one of the challenges we'll continue to have throughout this campaign. Um, my website is delbeneforcongress.com. And there's also information there where you can sign up for uh, to volunteer or get engaged involved or get a sign as Rick was talking about. Um, and so uh, just if you want any more information, um, we'll put it in the comments below too, so you have that. And again, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, great. Well, thanks. I've got a, a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay. And they're pretty easy, um, uh -oh. but um, some, some of them will be fun. But uh, 
you know, we all, as members of Congress, I, I tell people we are very simple creatures, right? And so like, you don't need to know much about us. You just need to know that we all represent a defined boundary of a district. And what we, what drives us is how we can make things better in that defined boundary of a district, right? The people we represent. And as a result, some things we end up doing, we hear from people directly and then we go work on it. Um, or there might be a particular legislative issue that's really focused on something that's uh, in your own district. So my first question actually for you, Susan, is, you know, we're working on some very heady issues, very important, Justice and Policing Act, COVID-19 response and recovery. But is there one or two legislative issues that you're working on that are just unique to the first congressional district? Um, well, one, um, oh, that's unique just to the first congressional district. Um, um, well, there's one that's not unique to the first congressional district, but is very important um, because um, we are a technology hub in our in the first district, but in our region. Um, and that's protecting c consumer data privacy. Um, all oh, yeah. of you should be able to be in charge of your personal data, should be able to um, opt in in terms of how it's used. So it's not used unless you give your consent um, so that you have clear information on how personal information is gonna be used. We don't have rules of the road there in, um, in our country. Um, California put some laws in place and Washington state has talked about putting some laws in place, but we, we need, I believe we need a federal um, piece of legislation. And this is actually an international issue because we should be helping set those standards internationally. Um, Europe and others have moved forward there, we haven't. So, um, so it's, um, I have a background in technology, but this is also, this is an issue kind of that hits every segment um, of our economy and that you share information in all sorts of ways. Um, and we should make sure that you're in control of your personal information. We've seen how that's been abused. Um, I've even helped introduce legislation to make sure privacy protections are in place when we look at contact tracing with respect to the pandemic so that it is used for public health purposes as um, as we want that to um, we, we want it to be used in that way but that it's never used in other ways that information is um, destroyed when it's no longer needed um, and so that's an area that is uh, important in a technology regional like ours but like I said it's important across the country and something we don't talk a lot about. Um, in Congress, unfortunately, um, and we shouldn't because it impacts our life day to day. Yeah, this consumer data privacy is a big issue. Is your, is your? I, I think I'm a co-sponsor of your legislation, if I'm not mistaken. But um, would you characterize it as closer to the California model or closer to the European Union model? Uh, well, um, actually, it's probably. Uh, I'd say my, my the legislation is. Um, fairly narrow in that it really focuses just on consumer data privacy, about making okay. sure you use clear language, that you have consent, uh, that we have enforcement at the federal level. Um, the Because we don't have kind of that core, those core elements, like who's going to enforce those that hasn't been decided at the federal level, which is important um, for legislation. Um, the difference between California is this would be a federal law across the country. I think we need a federal law that's consistent so you know your rights wherever you are in the country. Um, but also that so we are talking internationally. Um, the EU has started to look more deeply at things like um, artificial intelligence, et cetera, which we need to be looking at, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, but we are behind um, because we haven't even done the basic first step of making sure that people are in control of their data. So. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. the first step. We got a lot of other stuff we got to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've a you've you've answered this question a million times, um, but but not on this Facebook Live event. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or for True. Other, I haven't uh, answered since I've never done this one with you before. I can guarantee exactly. I haven't answered it. Either. Exactly. You were a uh, high school football referee or uh, a youth youth football referee. I was a high school football referee. Yes, well, you. Yeah. So we went from kind of um, Pop Warner Middle School all the way through yeah. high school varsity. Yeah. How did you get into that? Um, you know, my family. Like, <laughs> I knew there was a question in there somewhere. Um, my, uh, <laughs> you know, my my 
family were football fans. Uh, my parents were football fans, both for college and um, my my um, dad was from a place called Green Bay, Wisconsin, which uh, yeah, might make you uh, think <laughs> about um, about where he where his allegiance was. Um, but uh, the um, I just thought it would be something fun to do to be involved with a sport um, right out of college. I went to school where you get trained to be a referee and then started um, doing refereeing. I always say it's my best training for Congress because um, <laughs> in the end you have to decide and in the end we have to decide. We have to push a button, yes or no, um, or present, but um, pretty much yes or no are, are the answers. And um, you take whatever information you have, you make a decision and whatever you do, someone's angry with you. And then uh, as a referee, no matter what you decide, um, someone's unhappy with you. And um, and kind of that's a, a challenge, right? To be able to mm -hmm. take the information, do the best you can knowing that um, still there's gonna be folks who are, are um, who are sought the other way. Um, and, uh, and so it was, and, and in, in campaigns and things like that, where things can be, you know, people can be very critical of you, as you might have experienced over your years of campaigning. Um, I think it's important to, you know, ha have had that experience. I didn't realize at the time how important it was going to be in, in this particular um, area, um, but uh, but yeah, now we there had been a um, a congressional kind of football game, which is not very interesting to watch um, some folks play, but I've. I refereed at a charity game and I refereed at that um, too. So maybe <laughs> oh, yeah. you can play in that game sometime. Oh, there could have there was a time where I could have played in that game, but <laughs> the time is <laughs> <was> long past. <laughs> um, I'm a big soccer fan, so I play a, in the uh, congressional soccer charity game. And, yep. um, yeah. So, so let me, uh, on that, on that point, do you, so you're a big Seahawks fan, like a, a, I am too, but a lot of folks yeah. are, and, and I don't want to get far afield. I don't know if people watching are big Seahawks fans and I don't want to spend all the, all the time talking football, but I do want to ask when you go to games, cause you go to a few games, uh, uh, I understand it. Do you, how much time do you watch the plays and how much time are you grading the referees? Um, I, uh, I, I'll, always have binoculars with me so I can um, see up close um, and make my own opinion on a decision. But I'm watching the game, but definitely have an opinion on calls, especially when um, calls come up that are controversial and, and I disagree with. But um, your, your, uh, your opinions might actually, about referees might actually be informed. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, and also the high school rules and, and NFL rules are a little different, so I always have to remember, um, you know, and things have changed over time, but still, um, it's all about being in the right position so you get a good view of what's happening too, which is, uh, right. you know, you, yeah. you can't, can never predict, so that can be hard, but we never had instant replay and things like that. So. <laughs> not, not in high school. Uh, just one more set of questions, and then I then you can ask me some questions, then we'll go, go to Jack. Okay. But um, so people confuse me with Adam Smith, uh, Congressman Smith. So Adam and I, um, you mentioned my birthday yesterday, and thank you again. Um, Adam is it was Adam's birthday yesterday as well. Um, Adam and Smith not just the is, same day, the same year too, right? We are the exact same age. We are an answer to a congressional trivia question. Uh, the only members of Congress representing the same state who were born on the same day in the same year, serving at the same time. Uh, in in th 230 years of Congress, it's never happened until the year 2001 when I was sworn in. And so, um, but on top of that, um, we are we do get confused. Uh, pe people confuse us with each other. Um, other members of Congress confuse us with each other. Uh, we have the same haircut. Um, you know, I'm a little taller, um, however, <laughs> and Adam always asked when I was exactly born, he wants to know he was born before me, uh, even on the same day. <laughs> um, is there a member of Congress that you get confused with that other people confuse you with another member of Congress? Absolutely. Um, and it, uh, is it, is has, it Adam uh, Smith? Been true. <laughs> it is not Adam Smith or Rick Larson. Um, uh, it's Suzanne Bonamici who oh. does not look anything. Um, and uh, so anyone can go look up Suzanne. Suzanne represents um, part of Oregon. Um, and uh, 
my name, as many of you know, is spelled um, strange. It's Susan, but it's S-U-Z-A-N, and she's Suzanne. Her last name is Bonamici and Del Bene, Italian um, origin last names. And the Northwest states people confuse all the time. Um, <laughs> That's right, you know, yeah. Uh, we're just, we're just a blob. Yeah, we're just a blob north of California. The two states are just exactly. A blob <laughs> and um, and we were both elected in special elections um, in the 112th Congress. So we both came in mid cycle a little bit. If folks remember when I first ran, it was kind of Jay Inslee had um, had uh, left Congress to run for governor, and I filled the remainder of his term. In the old first district to make it more complicated. Um, but Suzanne and I came kind of mid cycle. Our names were close enough that because people see the way mine spelled and they think it's pronounced Suzanne. And then we're Oregon, Washington. So we don't look anything alike, but people <laughs> constantly can't remember is that Susan or Suzanne? Is it Oregon or Washington? So um, we still to this day um, get confused. And people will walk up and talk to me about issues in Oregon and and to Suzanne uh, about issues in uh, in Washington. In and Washington so uh, we're good friends, and so it works out okay. So, um, that's so. Good. and, and this, it's going to exist forever now. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Where's your <laughs> Where's the spelling uh, Where's the spelling of your first name come from? I have a, parents My mom. I did do it differently. She just did. She see it somewhere. My mom and. If you uh, met my mom, it would all be clear because um, my mom <laughs> thought it's it's uh, not Susan, it's Susan, and it should be S U C A N. Um, and so she kind of did that, not knowing that we were going to be in an era where you would be using email and the spelling of your name would become very critical for how people communicate with you. Um, yeah. And so uh, yeah, so lots of people still call me Suzanne. Um, and uh, or try to fix the spelling of my name and make it S U S A N, so it'll always be confusing out there. Just like I think for you, um, <laughs> you must get that with Larson with an E and with an O. Oh, e N and O N drives me crazy, because O N is Swedish and E N is uh, uh, Norwegian. And for those who even know that, um, the history between the Swedes and Norwegians isn't. It's very amicable and and and. And it isn't as well. So it's a, it's a point of pride. <laughs> so, yeah. My, I have a sister, Susie, um, it's Suzanne, but it's, uh, we shortened it to S U Z I, Susie. Um, and we called her, we usually just called her Suze. So, um, yep. I, I don't know if you were ever called Suze. <laughs> it's called Susie. My family still calls me Susie. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's how I was uh, growing up. Yeah. 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 Right. Now, there are two people. There are now, two people left um, in the world who call me Ricky. There are two people left in the world who still call me Ricky. <laughs> the interesting thing for my family is when they call, they would sound weird if they called me Susan, um, because I'm so used to them calling me Susie. It, and if other yeah. people called me Susie, it would sound strange too. It's kind of what you expect from, right. from folks. So. Okay. Um, but one of my sisters is a is a constituent in the second congressional district. She lives oh. in Bellingham. So um, great. Um, so I have I have family in in uh, on, in the second district as well. Um, I, sh I should be more so attentive. Turning the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turning the tables a little bit. Um, you know, we had a a dialogue during the last campaign where I would say. Um, um, I've never served in the majority. We talked about how important it was for um, Democrats to take the majority in the House, which I think is very should be very clear to everyone how important that was. Um, but uh, um, and you would always say, I would say, I don't know what it's like, and you would always say it's better. Um, <laughs> so here we are um, back in the majority, and you are right, um, it is better. Um, so what this Congress have you been working on that? Um, we wouldn't have been able to do uh, if we weren't in the majority. Oh, um, well, there's yeah a variety of things. I think if we weren't in the majority, um, we wouldn't have been, uh, been able to pass um, climate change, the, the climate change legislation that we have passed. Um, we passed the, uh, the bill, HR 9, I think it was, to uh, force the US back into the Paris Climate Change Agreement that wouldn't have happened if we were in the minority. 
in the U.S. House. Um, uh, now, of course, the Senate's sitting on all this, but I tell folks one, there's two things. One is the odds of the, the odds of a bill passing are zero if we don't pass it out of the House or the Senate, and the odds of a, um, and the odds improve to zero to 100 percent if we do pass it out of the House and send, and send it to the Senate. So even though Mitch McConnell's sitting on that that bill, it's important that we did that. We passed the lower drug cost tax, and we actually there's a lot of lip service from the Republicans on prescription drug costs and lowering prescription drug costs. We passed legislation um, HR three and, and passed it over to the uh, over to the Senate. Um, th there, and the reason we do this, as you know, right? It, it's they may not pass it as is, but there is a lot of decision making and a lot of uh, uh, you know, leverage that is going to take place as we get into the end of the year and think about the spending bills and the, the budget bills and so on. And passing bills over to the Senate gives us the opportunity to take those bills and put them in things that have to pass. Um, and so, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been, um, wouldn't have passed, passed that. Um, things I've been working on specifically that I think there would have been a different approach maybe. Um, I know because there is this difference. Unfortunately, you know, we saw the two crashes of the 737 Max and um, in Ethiopia and in Indonesia. And so we've been in the committee working on a reform bill to actually reform how the FAA um, uh, sees its relationships with not just Boeing, but with with the entire private aviation sector. And it's been um, a, it's been very close. And we need to. Um, uh, create more space between the regulator, the government regulator, and the private industry on this. And based on my experience with the last year and a half, I think the response from the Republicans wouldn't have been as strong as um, as as we are taking it. And I and I expect that we're going to introduce our own legislation. It's we've been working on it. The Senate introduced legislation uh, recently to reform certification. But it's definitely led by Republicans because it doesn't. It's not going to go as far as we're going to uh, as we're going to take it when we introduce our legislation. So it it, it does make a difference <laughs> to be in the majority. And when you asked me that question in 2018, you know what's it like, and I said it's better. I mean, it is it is better. And I I'm sure your question was originally more about you know what what are the things you get to do? What are the, <laughs> let, let's go into some detail about that. You know, that's that's all important and it's primary, but above that, it is better to be in the majority. So we need to keep fighting to keep in the majority uh, and get the Senate to be in the majority and ultimately get the Democrats to be the majority in the White House <laughs> as well. Because yeah. it will be um, even and better. You're a, and you're a subcommittee chair as a result too. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a ch chair of the aviation subcommittee. Adam is the uh, chair of the full armed services committee. And because of that, you know, think about the armed services. You almost are, since people confuse you. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll sit in the chair. No one recognize. No one really <laughs> sees the difference. Um, um, we passed family medical leave for federal employees last year as part of the defense bill. So two million more people now have paid family medical leave uh, or the federal employees because Democrats were in the position to make that happen, uh, as an example. And so. Uh, it's important that we that you know if you if we care about democratic and progressive values, it's important to keep the Democrats in the majority. Now, um, one uh, last question before I want to make sure I give it back so you have time for us to take yeah. other questions. But um, um, so if you go in um, my office in DC, I uh, definitely have lots of things that will remind you of the first congressional district, and that has definitely accumulated over time. But what are the things in your office in DC, if someone, if one of your constituents came out, what are the things they would see that would remind them of the second district? Um, first off, I will say I'm a terrible decorator. And so um, <laughs> I, I'm not very good at this, but, um, they will recognize above my desk is a hand carved cedar raven that was carved by a, a Swinomish um, uh, tribal member in 2001 um, for the office. And so 
that sits above my desk. There's also a paddle um, that's carved by the uh, Tulalip carver uh, that's um, up on the wall as well. And I think folks would recognize that because of the deep, long, um, obvious uh, history that the tribes have here uh, on the on the uh, in in the Salish Sea, and so uh, I think they'd recognize that. And we also have um, uh, um, a very various scenes from the district, uh, including Muckleteo Lighthouse. There's a painting of the Muckleteo Lighthouse. Um, I think we got the updated to uh, uh, updated Skagit Valley Tulip Festival. Um, sign. Unfortunately, there was no tulip festival this year. Um, so folks will recognize uh, things like that. Um, um, the most interesting thing, though, is not from the district, I think. Um, it's a, a picture of uh, uh, President Obama and uh, about 12 other members of Congress, or 12 members of Congress, and some of the his cabinet and White House staff uh, from a, a basketball game we pay, played, I think in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, when when the White House played sports. So, <laughs> I have a picture that you're in of uh, President Obama and us at um, the Oso Firehouse, um, oh, no. mm -hmm. right up the landslide that um, is hanging in my office. That is. Uh, one important piece, I have a raspberry, a picture of a lot of raspberries um, <laughs> from uh, Whatcom County and um, all of our raspberries. I also have the tulip picture with Mount Baker in the background, uh, a yeah. beautiful picture there, um, very, uh, very much shared areas. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, let me turn it back over to you so we Yeah, continue. so Jack, uh, Jack Wallman uh, is still on and Jack, if we got some questions that we can uh, try to answer. Yeah, we've got a bunch of questions. Um, they're for both of you, so I'll let you fight over who wants to answer them first. Um, this first one is from Francis. Having just read a study concerning coronavirus, it was mentioned that the public is more confused by the government's mixed messages that they are than they are by misinformation. So I guess government mixed messages on how to you know stay safe and stay healthy. How do we get truthfully, truthful, timely information on COVID? Yeah, Susan? Um, so first I um, encourage folks to go to the State Department of Health and also our county um, public health departments have been doing a good job of putting um, information up in terms of what's happening, what the rates are, where um, folks are at in terms of the stages of reopening and um, so that there's information about um, what you, what folks should be able to do and um, and and the policies you should be following because this is I'm I'm a scientist at heart um, I think the we need to have a data driven response and um, I do think that we have seen throughout our region people looking at the data looking at the science and um, and making decisions based on that in terms of what we should do in terms of protections, but also um, looking at how things should reopen. Um, it is uh, not a perfect science. Um, we need to do everything we can and then continue to um, just take our personal responsibility, be safe, um, wear a mask um, when you're outside um, with where there are other people um, or inside where there will be other people around you. Um, keep that social distancing. These are some things we do at the Capitol when we're back, um, the last time we were back voting, um, wear a mask inside the Capitol all the time on the floor of the house, um, just that responsibility. But I do think our our, um, our local public health officials have been uh, doing a good job of making sure there's accurate um, and uh, accurate information available to communities. And I know on, on on my official website we put information there to um, to connect people to all of those resources if you aren't quite sure where um, where to find that information. Yeah, I, I'll just add this by saying it's it's hard though to, to live in a country where you expect your leaders to say and do the right things, especially when you know we have a national emergency like we have with the pandemic and. Um, and yet we, you know, we don't have that leader. The, pre the president is not interested in providing um, accurate information. He's 
seems to be only interested in, in providing information that helps him, um, that helps his narrative. And, and we're seeing the impacts of that when you look at Texas and Arizona as two states where they reopened probably too quickly and we're seeing spikes in, in coronavirus um, cases in those, in those states and in several other states. Not every state that's reopened, but, but certainly in some states. And so just to underscore what Susan said about going to local websites is probably the best way to get the information County Public Health, County uh, Health District here in Snohomish County, um, and then the State Department of Health uh, website is where you're going to get the best, most accurate uh, information. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, staying on the uh, topic of COVID, uh, we have a question about the Heroes Act. Uh, this is from Willie. How can we ensure rent relief and hunger relief with the Senate not taking up the HEROES Act? Thanks so much for both of you for getting it to pass the House. Yeah, um, so the HEROES Act is, uh, some of you might know, but it's a, a bill we passed uh, in May, uh, three, nearly $3 trillion uh, bill, which is necessary. It shows the magnitude of how deep this recession is and how much assistance um, people, uh, families, workers, and small businesses need around the country. And as part of that um, bill, um, we included nearly a trillion dollars for state and local governments and territorial and tribal governments as well. And there's assistance in there as well for food, uh, food security, and, and, and rental relief. And how to get the bill passed, um, I don't think it's gonna pass, and this wild prediction, right? I don't think it's gonna pass the way we wrote it. Um, out of the Senate. But what I do tell people is the more Mitch McConnell, um, and sorry for saying his name, um, the more the Senate Majority Leader complains about it and says how bad it is, uh, the higher the odds are that something will pass because he's publicly negotiating essentially. Um, and uh, even Speaker Pelosi said early on, we're going to pass this Heroes Act and this is our offer. This is our, our first offer on getting something done. But I think as the numbers come out in terms of how how badly states and local governments have been hit, in terms and then in terms of being able to um, offer services, do just basic services, it's going to put a lot more pressure on the Senate to take some action, and then we'll go from there. Um, I just want to add on um, the Heroes Act, as uh, was mentioned in the question. Um, really contains important policy to um, help with rental assistance, um, to uh, help um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, um, to make sure that there's uh, more expanded availability and expanded resources there. Um, we had a housing crisis before the pandemic, and we continue to have food insecurity across our country before the pandemic. So I think the legislation, the HEROES Act is important, but continue. we had a tax on SNAP um, long before the pandemic too. The administration was trying to cut those benefits. You know, The average SNAP benefit is about $30 a week. And um, if you take the SNAP challenge, something um, that I've done with my staff, um, Try living for a week off of $30 a week and see what you're able to, or try uh, eating for a week with $30 and see what you're able to um, buy at the grocery store. It's hard to buy fresh fruits and vegetables and healthier foods. Um, so these are not luxurious benefits. They're um, essential benefits, but we need to continue to make sure that everyone in our country has healthy, nutritious food. And um, we need to make sure that folks have a affordable, safe place to live. And I've been leading the effort on the affordable housing tax credit so we get more affordable housing across our country. Um, so I just wanna highlight that the emergency response is critical, but these are also issues that we have to continue um, to make a priority going forward um, because we started out in a place where there were challenges already. Thanks. Great. So our next question comes from Susan uh, with an S. And Susan <laughs> asks, uh, do we need to worry about the post office closing? 
Susan? Um, well, um, one of the important pieces of uh, the HEROES Act and also something we put in the CARES Act is to make sure there's support for the post office because um, the post office financially has been in a challenge situation since I became a member of Congress. Um, um, they have special guidelines on having to prepay pensions far, far in advance and things that make it hard. And we have an administration that um, is not supportive and is doing all they can to undermine the post office. Um, so we put uh, um, resources in the HEROES Act to, um, there is some in the CARES Act, not nearly enough, um, more in the HEROES Act. And I also want to highlight how critical this is for vote by mail. Because as we talk about needing to make sure that folks have access to the ballot in a safe way during a pandemic, we know how critical vote by mail is because of what we see here in Washington State um, and the difference it's made. Um, the the um, the hero the CARES Act had some money to help states go to vote by mail. The Heroes Act has more, and it's not restricted in the same way the Heroes Act had it restricted. So we know folks will have more access to expand vote by mail, but we also have to make sure that those resources are available at the post office so um, that uh, we have some place for someone to mail to, but clearly the post office is critical for many other reasons as well. And um, I think the administration will continue to make it difficult for them to manage the financial challenges. Some of those challenges are in place because of Congress and I've continued to work on legislation to change that. Yeah, again, I think here's one area where there, it means something to have Democrats in the majority. I don't know what, where the post office would be right now if Republicans had the majority in the House and the Senate and the presidency, but they don't. And uh, the Democrats put in, I think, I think it was, it was 25 or 20 or $25 billion to the post office in the HEROES Act. And, um, and it's not only the need to pass that, but uh, Susan alluded to it, but there's a 2006 or 2007 bill where we required the post office uh, to prepay um, pension um, pension payments, and uh, that sounded like a good sounded good at the time. The economy was doing really well. The recession hit, and it became one of the worst ideas ever, and still a bad idea. And we did pass legislation in the House to rescind that prepayment requirement. And that's over in the Senate uh, right now uh, as well. And those two things together would go a long way to supporting the post office. Back to the vote by mail, um, I'm still shocked. To, I'm still shocked to get comments on my Facebook site when I talk about how great vote by mail is from people from Washington State who say that we should have a voter ID law. Um, uh, because uh, as you know, um, if you apply to voter ID law to vote by mail, the person confirming that you are the person filling out your ballot is you uh, under a voter ID law <laughs> applied to vote by mail. People, so people just don't really, some of the anti vote by mail people in our own state really don't understand the, the, the process as well. Uh, and it's a bit of a frustration, but vote by mail is only one thing. And I support national vote by mail as, is, uh, as Susan noted for herself. But we also need to pass the Voting Rights Advancement Act 2019. Uh, this not only fixes uh, the Shelby County decision the Supreme Court did, which uh, stripped out, I think, Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, but it, uh, and it, it so it, it fixes that problem, but also goes further to guarantee um, early voting, Sunday voting, uh, to guarantee all, all these steps to that allow access to the ballot box if you're, you know, if you're registered and legally able to legally able to vote. And we, so, you know, national vote by mail is one thing we can do, but we need to do a lot more, not just to protect the vote that you're right to vote, but to protect the integrity of that vote. That is the vote that is counted is the one that you provided. And uh, there's a long, long way to go on, on that work as well. One of the first bills we passed is Congress on voting rights. Uh, yeah, for the for the people in the House. In the House again, good reason to have Democrats in the majority. <laughs> oh, great! Our next question comes from Robin, and it's about unemployment. And Robin says, "Can you please address the unemployment issue? 
It is nearly impossible to get through to tier three for unemployment. I have been waiting 12 weeks. Unemployment is a huge issue. We need action now, please help. Yeah, th thanks Robin. So the unemployment rate in Snohomish County is the highest in the, in the state. It's at 20.2%. In Skagit, it's the second highest. I think it was 19.4 and Whatcom's tied the third in terms of uh, counties of the highest unemployment rate. So uh, this is an issue. It's an important issue anyway for the entire state, but it really hits our district, Susan's and my district, especially hard uh, as well. <clears throat> um, and the the challenge of, I think maybe what Robin's um, also um, talking about is the unemployment system, the uh, employment security department and uh, their ability to process these claims. And uh, it's been especially frustrating for a lot of people. There is a backlog. Then there was the fraud, which resulted in employment security stopping processing claims altogether until they got that figured out. And now they're back to processing claims. They've actually called in the Washington State National Guard to help uh, with, um, with the employment security department uh, to help process claims and, and answer phones as well. So, I mean, our National Guard is packing food boxes they're getting ready, ready for wildfire season and they're helping get these claims processed. I would suggest um, for anyone who has a specific case on employment security, the, the governor's office and the Department of Employment Security um, uh, have let us know as members of Congress that we can, um, we do a lot of casework all the time. And so we are um, able to bring cases to the employment security department on behalf of the constituents who we represent and uh, get those elevated because we're, you know, because it's a casework request. And so um, if Robin wants to contact my office or Susan's office, um, I, I, I'm sure, I, I, sorry, I won't speak for Susan's office. I'm, I'm sure you can contact her office. I was going to say the exact same thing um, if you didn't say it, which is, uh, yeah. Um, we have caseworkers doing this work. So um, depending on where you live, contact your representative because we yeah. do casework for folks who are our constituents. So um, yeah. if you live in the district, um, contact them. If you live in mine, me. If you live in one of our colleagues, contact them and um, they should be able to um, help at least uh, get that, uh, get you the information you need and help move that through. And um, we put up yeah. on, on my official website, we have information too on on what's happening with unemployment, but it's been a large attack, um, fraud attack that has been uh, hugely problematic in our state and in other states. And they're just trying to now go through the process to make sure that every claim is a legitimate claim. And I would note on the broader issue of unemployment, um, the, the public health emergency is, is going to lead the economic recovery. Um, the Fed chair, uh, Jerome Powell, actually made that argument uh, uh, yesterday, that exact argument. We have to get, we have to beat COVID-19 to go back fully. And um, otherwise, we're going to be put in a position of going backwards if we get uh, another big outbreak. And we don't know what's going to happen this fall. There's always talk about in the fall, we might get a second wave. And I don't want a second wave, but we can do our best to prevent that by doing all the right things on the public health side. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, uh, I'm on the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in Congress. And tomorrow morning, we're doing a markup, which, which we take a big bill and we amend it. Um, uh, that's what markup means. And we're going to be doing that on a, on a $500 billion five-year transportation infrastructure bill as part of the longer-term infrastructure-based recovery plan that Democrats have. And so we're already taking steps to address uh, longer-term employment in the United States uh, as well in Congress. Probably, again, something wouldn't have happened if, if Democrats didn't have the majority. If you're um, interested in you, um, you can watch um, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee um, tomorrow um, and you can watch their hearing um, on the Ways and Means uh, side. We're having a, a hearing with um, the U.S. Trade Ambassador um, to talk about trade issues, which are have been such a huge issue in our region. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if you're interested in that, you can um, 
you can watch the Ways and Means hearing in the morning too, because it will all be done virtually, just kind of like the conversation we're having right now. Yeah, it'll be live streamed. Uh, mine's, mine's at 7 a.m. Uh, West Coast time, Pacific Mine's Northwest at 7 a.m. too. Oh, yeah, 7 as well. <laughs> yeah. So not, not that we don't love to get up early and work on your behalf, but uh, getting up at, um, earlier than seven in order to uh, probably do an all day hearing is, it's, it's part of the job and I love the job. I lo it's a great privilege to do this, I'll say that. Well, great. Um, next question and then I guess I'll invite both of you to, to add some closing remarks um, and we can conclude the event. So yesterday's Supreme Court decision was a step forward for equality for LGBTQ plus people. What can be done in Congress to continue to advance the goals of equality and to protect LGBTQ plus people? Yeah. Uh, Susan? Uh, well, um, first, uh, it's Pride Month, and this is an important time, and yesterday's decision was um, important um, in terms of protecting um, non-discrimination uh, rights for the LGBTQ community. The day before the Trump administration undermined um, access to healthcare um, for folks in the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community as well, which was a, a terrible decision, not, not a court decision, a decision by the administration. So um, here we had um, on the, the anniversary of the Pulse shooting, uh, just a, a terrible decision by the administration and uh, a, a positive, a uh, very positive outcome um, yesterday and maybe surprising outcome for a lot of folks. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to continue to make sure that in, that we end discrimination um, in all areas. Um, in the House, we passed legislation called the Equality Act to address um, all of the discriminatory policies that are put in place, particularly with respect to LGBTQ um, community members. So the, um, the Equality Act, I think, is one of the most important pieces of legislation we could pass and um, pass strongly with strong support out of the House. Um, but uh, um, unfortunately, as Rick has mentioned a few times, uh, we still have legislation sitting in the Senate. Um, so the Supreme Court case was definitely a important milestone. The um, day before was um, unfortunately also a reminder that we need to make sure we have strong laws in place so we can't have executive actions taken like um, happened on Monday. Yeah. Um I woke up uh, yesterday morning to that good news, to that great news. I, I love it when the Constitution is right. <laughs> it's been, there's a lot of folks who, look, who, who re read the Constitution and, and look at only its limits. And the whole idea, in my view, um, behind the Constitution was to, to guarantee rights and to guarantee opportunities. And um, you know, I think the Supreme Court uh, on a 6-3 vote um, got it right. And I'm, I just, it just did my heart a lot of good to see one more step. And it's, it's, it's an important step, but there's so many more steps um, to take uh, to ensure that the rights that I take for granted are extended to everybody. And, and that, you know, I, I, I would like everyone to equally take all rights for granted because they are just, they're what we have and everybody gets to use them. And we don't live in that country yet. And, but we keep moving towards that, uh, which is a great thing about the United States as well, um, despite our challenges and we have challenges. And on the issue of what more can be done, I'm on the armed services committee and the decisions this administration has made about the role of transgendered individuals in our military, uh, those are egregious. They're uh, terrible, their steps backwards, and they're denying people, uh, de denying Americans the opportunity to serve their country as well. And so th th that's an area where we need to um, continue to move forward. Um, housing discrimination still exists. Uh, we need to move, move forward on that. Susan mentioned the Equality Act, which is a, an important piece of legislation to address a lot of these issues. Um, and without putting things into law, um, we are left with executive orders. Um, so when President Obama put things, you know, did things through executive order, 
we all supported those things, but um, uh, we all supported those things, but uh, you know, the next president comes in and starts rescinding them. So we need to put things into law. Um, and I'll go back to the theme uh, here. Um, if you have a Democratic majority in the Senate and the House and a Democratic president, we will put things put things into law. So, um, so with that, uh, Susan, I'll give you. A, um, I'll, I'll wrap up after. Uh, say a few words. So thank you again for doing this. This was um, fun, and it, it's uh, um, it's nice. I appreciate everybody with your, your questions. I know you may have more. I think we'll we'll continue to put our information. Um, it's probably up there in the comment um, area too. If you want to contact, if you have other questions uh, about things, um, that's how that's how um, we're able to do our jobs in the best way possible is to hear from you. Um, and you know, sometimes we hear conflicting views, etc. But that information helps us to come up with solutions to help serve our communities. And so I really appreciate the engagement. Um, my one um, plea for everyone is be engaged, be involved, speak up, speak out, and vote. Um, this is by far the most important election we've ever had. And so your, your activism, your participation makes a difference um, for you and inspires others in the community. So thanks for being engaged and involved and, um, and working hard to make sure that everyone gets out to vote um, this election. And thanks, Rick, for letting me join you today. Sure. And what's that campaign address again? It's DelBeneforCongress.com. Okay, great. Great. Um, well, I'm going to have you on more often because no one's ever sat down an hour with me and said they had fun. So I really appreciate <laughs> hearing that. It's the first time for no, everything. <laughs> the first time for everything. So um, I yeah I want to I want to thank Susan for for being on the Facebook Live event and uh, uh, for it, it's she you're a great partner at, in the in the counties we we share and I, I really uh, appreciate that the prospect of of you know eight years ago when um, Brand X ran against you and and having that person and, and it just did not make me excited at all um, so it's been a great partnership and I look forward to continuing. Um, to, to share, to share um, counties. Um, probably we'll have some changes in the next couple of years with redistricting, but uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun working with you. And, th and thanks for coming on. Uh, my, my website is ricklarson.org and I encourage people to uh, go to that. Again, to provide any comments, any feedback on this um, uh, uh, Facebook Live event, as well as the volunteer for, for my campaign uh, too. And, 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 uh, and I'm sure Susan would say, uh, share it with your friends. Um, so, um, if I had a blog or if I had a podcast, I would call it, um, uh, Pacific Northwest time because everyone thinks the West coast is California and they forget that we're up here in our corner of the country. And so uh, until, until the next Pacific Northwest time, uh, we'll see you all later. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks.